I'm Bill Grob, Director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois and Vice Chair of SC20 Invited Talks. Welcome to the SC20 Invited Talk session on quantum futures. The overarching theme of SC20 is more than HPC. Complementing this theme, the Invited Talks collectively focus on applications and technologies impacting all areas of science, engineering, medicine, and society. The distinguished speakers in this session will provide insight into the fascinating world of quantum computing technologies and on how it is rapidly evolving with the potential to shape the future of computing. Dr. Marissa Justina is a senior research scientist and quantum electronics engineer who joined Google's quantum effort in 2016. Her thesis at the University of Vienna focused on systems she designed and built for conscientiously testing Bell's inequality using entangled optical photons. Hybridizing a love for quantum fundamentals and with a passion for engineering and building efficient systems, Justina wears many hats within the Google Quantum AI Lab. These include leading device packaging and developing tools and hardware across the system stack to scale up Google's quantum processors while enabling excellent performance. Hello, my name is Marissa Justina. I'm a senior research scientist and quantum electronics engineer with Google's quantum computing team. And I'm going to share a bit about the work we're doing to build a useful quantum computer. Before I get into that, I want to share a bit of quantum computing background. What is a qubit or quantum bit? What distinguishes that from a classical bit? Why we should make them? How many we need to make? And then the rest of the presentation will concentrate on our work toward building a prototype. Before we get into what a qubit is, it makes sense to start even taking one step back and thinking about what information is. Uh, to aid that exercise, I've made this table about information processing machines and uh, comparing the classical ones to the quantum. With classical information, we usually think of a bit, like a switch that could be in the state one or zero. That, that state, uh, that, that bit can be built into a computer or you can think of an abacus, but every computing machine from the abacus to the smartphone is based on these same classical rules of physical information processing, where a bit is a one or zero. And how do we read out our bits? Well, we simply look at them. We can see the bit is either in the zero state or the one state. And for manipulating the information, we will simply flip the switch. Uh, we, we build gates also, like the AND gate or an OR gate that will uh, manipulate other bits based on the state of current bits. Now, we could consider, though, that maybe it's interesting to try encoding information according to a different set of rules. For example, we could use the very fundamental physical rules that govern the behavior of individual atoms and the formation of molecules. Now, from a physical perspective, that means that we will need precise control over individual objects that behave according to those rules. Now, the fact that these rules don't show up in our daily lives already suggests that this is going to be tricky. But so first, let's convince ourselves that it's worth the time. Now, what it would be a physical incarnation of a quantum state carrying object? There isn't really an everyday analog to this, but we could consider, for example, electron spins. This is actually a, a property that only exists within the quantum framework. Uh, or we could consider the energy level of an atom. So an atom has a nucleus with electron flying around the outside. That electron can be in, a, say, a lower energy level, or a photon can impinge to excite that electron up to a higher energy level. These are quantum states of the atom. But the way we then actually think about that quantum bit or qubit is as a point on the surface of a sphere. And the poles of that sphere correspond to the 0 and 1 states of the qubit. So our zero, as you can see, and the one, they have these funny brackets around them. And this is called bra ket notation. Uh, it, it really just means when you see this, this funny ket that this is a quantum state called whatever is inside. So in this case, it's a quantum state called zero. And this ket allows us to differentiate the classical zero state from the quantum zero state. Now, this actually means in order to represent any, any spot on the surface of that sphere, we will need two complex constants, one representing how much of the state is zero and the other representing how much of the state is one. Because they're complex, we can also have a phase element. And so, so we capture all spots on the surface of the sphere. Now, how can we read this thing out? Uh, it, it, 
What does it even look like to read out a state that's somewhere between zero and one? Well, we can't actually see that. That lives in the quantum world, but when we, do, when we perform a measurement, we bring the information into the classical world. And at that point, it has to look like classical information, which means it can only be zero or one. So when we measure a single qubit, we say we collapse it. It snaps into one of those states, zero or one. And we don't know what the state was before we performed the measurement anymore. To get around this or, or to work with this, what we do instead is we build an ensemble and, and we prepare many states in the same way and measure all of them and collect statistics. So for this particular example, that state is pretty close to zero. So most of the time we'll, we'll see zero, but every so often we'll measure one. Those are the statistics we would, we would see from the ensemble measurement of this particular qubit state. Then how do we manipulate our qubits? Uh, well, an, analog analogously to the classical bits where we will perform gates, we also perform quantum gates. Those quantum gates basically look like sending any one point on the surface of the sphere to any other point. So in this particular picture, I, I'm showing that we rotate one state around the axis, in this case, the Y axis, and this is called a Y gate, for example. Now, uh, this gives some, some way to start thinking about a a quantum concept you may have heard about in the past called superposition. Now, superposition describes a state that is partially zero and partially one, but it's still a very specific state. It's not just a jumbly mix of zeros and ones together. And here's, here's a way to think about it. So consider for a moment that we have the superposition state. It's a quantum state directly on the equator, and it's in this case aligned with the x-axis. Now, if we were to just measure this state, as I said before, we can only ever see zero or one as a measurement outcome. So half the time we'll see zero and half the time we'll see one. At this point, we might think, oh, this is just a, a mix, a fuzzy mixture of somewhere between zero, of, of some zero and some ones. And that's in fact not the case. And here's how we could observe. Suppose that before we perform our measurement, we add half of a Y gate, a Y half gate. We rotate just halfway around the Y axis. That will send this state on the equator down to the one. And then we will always measure one. That would not ever happen if superposition meant that there's some jumbled mixture of zeros and ones. So superposition is really a clean, specific quantum state. Now let's think about for a moment what happens when we have more than one bit. In the classical world, uh, we have a single bit. It looks like zero or one. In the quantum world, as I said before, our quantum bit is represented by these two constants, C0 and C1, that tell us how much of the qubit state is zero and how much of the qubit state is one. Both are complex. Now suppose we have a second bit in the classical world. We have two bits, we look at them separately. Here's the first bit, here's the second bit. Each of them is independent from the other. But the quantum case is a bit different. Actually, it's not possible to talk about the state of each qubit independently. We're, we're now worried about the state of a two qubit system. And that two qubit system contains correlations. So we need to be worried about the, how much of the qubit state is having both qubits zero? How much of the state has the first qubit zero and the second qubit one? One zero, one one, and really all four of these states. That means that now we need four complex constants in order to describe our two qubit uh, system. And so on, as we increase the number of quantum bits, we will increase exponentially the number of classical complex constants that we would need to describe them. What really happens, or what this highlights, is that information, in fact, is encoded in a richer space. The quantum information space is richer, and, and it's simply because the bits are no longer separable from each other in the way they are in the classical world. So how do we make a qubit? Well, our qubits are resonant electrical circuits. And I'll get into this a bit more later, how exactly we, we build them. But uh, they are, they're little resonators that capture very, very small amounts of energy. Um, one photon at around 5 or 6 gigahertz, to be, to be specific. That is not much energy at all. It corresponds to an ambient temperature in the couple hundred millikelvin regime. So uh, that's the, the tiny quanta of energy that encodes the qubit state. And uh, these qubits actually are fairly large. You can see. This, this chip is around um, a centimeter square, and those little structures in the middle, those are our qubits. So we, we pattern these structures out of aluminum on a silicon substrate. We mount them to the base of a dilution refrigerator. We cool them down to 20 millikelvin, which is a very cold temperature, or colder than outer space. And why does it need to be so cold? Um, there are a, a number of reasons. At a high level, uh, there are kind of two that, that pop up. One is to have superconductivity. And 
this superconducting circuit means that no, th that a circuit would be superconducting means that no electrical loss will happen in the qubit. So that energy that's stored inside is stored by some sloshing current. And as long as the current can flow free of loss, then we can imagine that quantum behavior will persist for a long time. The qubit were lossy, you could think that the energy is going to, to scatter out very quickly. The, this is a bit of a hand-waving argument. Um, there's, there's more to it, but at a high level, we need our qubits to be low loss. In particular, we need them to be long-lived. Another aspect of this is that if your environment is full of hot energy, photons flying around, and your qubit is encoded with a very, very small amount of energy, it will also be disturbed and destroyed very quickly. And, and the kind of recurring theme here is speed. Uh, Long-lived qubit is a critical thing because you need your qubits to stay around long enough that you can run your algorithms on them. In fact, getting a long-lived qubit is not trivial. And, and it will be critical for the development of quantum computation. In fact, arbitrary quantum computation will require a, a system of error correction in some sense. And I'll, I'll get into that a bit more in the future as well. But basically, quantum computers are fundamentally error prone. The, the quantum information has this short lifetime before it decoheres and escapes from the system. So why, why should we work on building a quantum computer? And, and you might ask what problems are best approached by a quantum processor. In fact, this is still an open research topic, but there are a few kinds of problems that we're particularly excited about for quantum computing. One is optimization style problems that may include root planning, or uh, there's some quantum approaches to taking advantage of neural networks and machine learning. Then there's also an, a desire to use a quantum processor as a simulation tool. And the similarity between a set of controllable quantum objects and molecular interactions seems to make it really a good tool for materials development. One particularly interesting use case might be to find a replacement for the Haber-Bosch process that we use to develop fertilizer. That, that process consumes 1 to 2 percent of the world's energy every year because the only way we know to produce fertilizer requires extremely high temperatures and high pressures. There's a little fungus that can do it at room temperature and, room, and, and ambient pressure, but not at the scale humans need. So instead, we, we dump tons of energy into building fertilizer. But if we could understand what that fungus is doing, we might be able to make energy much more, or make fertilizer much more energy efficiently. And to understand that, that chemical process, which is currently beyond, far beyond the reach of any classical computer simulation property, uh, capability, we could use a quantum computer as a simulator. You could think of that quantum processor as kind of being like a programmable molecule uh, or a quantum Lego set. So with that, I wanted to pivot toward discussing what we've done to build the prototype. So suppose you want to build a useful quantum computer. What, what should you do? Where, where to start? Well, let's, look, let's work backwards. We've got useful quantum computer. We'll start with the noun and, and work back through the adjectives. So what is a computer? Of course, it's a machine that performs computational tasks. If it should be quantum, what does that mean? Well, that means that it will need to be a controllable quantum system with many qubits, so many, single, many individual controllable quantum objects whose interaction with each other should also be controllable. And that means that we will need to harness zillions of these amplitudes, these complex values that would describe the amount of amplitude in each possible measurement configuration for that set of qubits. Beyond that, it needs to be useful. That's important. So what does useful mean in this case? As I already explained, error correction is going to be critical for a future quantum computer. And so error correction really will need to be developed both at a theoretical level and practically. But this work is not new. This has actually been ongoing for a while. And in fact, without the existing research in error correction theory, it's unlikely we would be so confident about the hardware research we're doing. Uh, back in 1995 already, a man named Peter Shor developed an error correction procedure and, and dis sort of mentioned or discovered that error correction is based on an assumption that we can describe quantum errors by what we call a digital error model. And that means that all errors in the evolving quantum system should be characterized by a localized set of bit flips or phase flips. In other words, we should be able to track the, the errors of the full system simply by knowing the individual discrete errors. 
And it's really not obvious that that should hold, because in a quantum system, that's a system that is decidedly not just the sum of its parts. So, and it's an open question whether the errors in a large quantum system can actually be treated as discrete and probabilistic. Now, the other half of useful, of course, is that the computer should be good for something. And in order to make progress on developing algorithms that can be used with, or that can be run on the, the processor and the computer that we would build, we need a good handshake between hardware developers like myself and algorithm developers who would write programs to run on this computer. And this is particularly critical in the near term while quantum processors are uh, kind of fledgling and, and each one is unique where uh, an algorithm must be written specifically for a certain processor. So what do we want in our prototype? Well, it's uh, basically this same list, but let's, let's run through it forward now. So to build an error correction compatible prototype, what do we need to do? I'll, I'll bring up this slide again. Our, our interest as a superconducting qubit group that we are, we're interested in what's called the surface code approach to error correction. It has this checkerboard pattern of qubits. Those little circles are qubits. The, the data qubits are black dots. The measure qubits are white dots. Um, so the, the data qubits we use to actually store the quantum information and the, the extra qubits are overhead um, that we perform parity measurements using those qubits to track errors and then follow and compensate their effect. Uh, so we need a lot of physical qubits in order to make one logical qubit to the point where in order to have a fully fault tolerant universal quantum computer, which we expect will take at least a decade, uh, we will need around a million qubits, or at least, uh, and they'll need to have the best performance we've ever seen in a two-dimensional array with nearest neighbor coupling. Now, the state of the art until about a year ago was roughly 10 qubits in a linear array. So we clearly had some, some work to do, and then we think, well, where should we start trying to build this prototype? Well, we can look at the around the 1,000 qubit level. That's the point where we could really start seeing some solid tests of this error correction. We expect that with around 1,000 physical qubits, we could build one long-lived logical qubit. But the jump from 10 to 1,000 is still a pretty big jump. So as we consider, uh, continue to consider where we might build this processor, we can also observe something interesting. Right around the 50 qubit range, and this is continuing ongoing research, but around 50 qubits, it suddenly becomes impossible for any classical computer to mimic and fully simulate a, a quantum processor of that size. So if we can build a processor of that size, we can actually enter a computation regime that is otherwise inaccessible. And we, we call that regime, or that regime has been coined in the field, the noisy intermediate scale quantum regime. We find it might be interesting to build a processor of that scale. There may be some interesting and undiscovered applications in that area. So this motivates our design of our prototype. We want to build an error correction compatible machine uh, or an error correction compatible prototype, which means now for us uh, around 50 qubits because that's an interesting size and a two-dimensional array where each qubit is touching and, and uh, communicating with its nearest neighbors. So the other half of useful, of course, is that we need an interface with our algorithm developers. And indeed, to that end, uh, it's, it's particularly critical, as I mentioned, in the NISC era, where algorithms really are specific to the processors that they run on. To achieve such a good collaboration between hardware and algorithm developers, we've developed what we call CERC, that is an open source Python framework for noisy intermediate scale quantum algorithms. And uh, it runs in Python. It features some convenient ASCII art to help see the circuit that you're, you're drawing. And this is what we use internally. It's been around for a few years now. We, we use it internally with our own algorithm developers, and it's available open source as well. Uh, so moving from that on to the next big point on our bullet list, we need the system to be a quantum prototype. In order to see that it is a good, well-functioning quantum prototype, we will need to demonstrate a full system level of high-quality control with low error gates and low error on the readout. So let's take a step back. Uh, we talked before about qubits. They are the fundamental unit of quantum information. We represent them as a point on the sphere. This is a very abstract picture. 
Of course, the, the word qubit actually is, uh, it's overloaded. It also is the same word we use to represent the physical fundamental unit of quantum computing hardware. And in this case, we build little resonators, so uh, like a, a capacitor and an inductor in parallel. In this case, we replace the inductor with a nonlinear inductor, this uh, blue element, and the capacitor is the orange element. You can see in that micrograph, the capacitor is that big plus in the middle, and the nonlinear inductor, or squid, is down in the blue square below. Uh, basically, we, we build these structures and we use them as natively quantum objects, which can allow us to make quantum information physical. So when we want to build our quantum processor, we observed before that we want a two-dimensional array. And the state-of-the-art devices before we started uh, working on our, our recent processor were just single rows. You can see there's a lot of other stuff on this chip too. We've got control wiring coming from the bottom, readout related uh, circuitry coming in from the top, and there's really not any space to align qubits row by row. So one of the first challenges was to develop an alternative architecture where we could somehow fit all of the readout and control information in the space around and between the qubits. And uh, in part, we've done this by separating the qubits and the control and the readout stuff onto separate chips, which we can then uh, combine together in a flip chip architecture. Uh, but then we've managed to build this one readout line kind of unit cell that we can then stamp as many times as we like, for example, nine times uh, to get a 54 qubit array in this case. And that is what we now call our Sycamore chip. We built this chip, it's aluminum patterned on silicon. It then gets mounted into a package, and this package is what allows us to go from uh, lines, traces that are drawn in fabrication on the silicon out to cables that we can then plug into our dilution refrigerator and route those signals all the way out to the outside world. And once we have that whole thing built and cooled down, then we have another giant hurdle to, to surpass, and that is what we call calibration. So what is calibration? Uh, one of my good friends who works on calibration is a musician and likes to describe calibration in this way. Just as a musical instrument can generate a sound wave that a listener interprets as a note, we use our control electronics to generate electrical waves that we hope the quantum bit will interpret as a specific gate. And a very capable musician is so good at getting a listener to hear the sound that they want because they're an expert at knowing how to use their instrument. Similarly, we have to learn how to use our control electronics adequately well to get the quantum gates, to get, to get, the, get the qubits to respond with the quantum gates that we wish. This uh, analogy goes even a bit further because the, um, the way that we write out quantum gates kind of looks like sheet music. So we have on each line, each uh, horizontal line, there's one qubit and then time goes from left to right and we play the gates, if you will, uh, across. In this case, the single qubit gates are those white boxes. The two qubit gates are those blue boxes that connect uh, two qubit lines. So uh, now we need to perform calibration of individual gates and check to see how well we've done. How would we do that? Well, we can start by running a gate, measuring the output, and seeing what the, out, what the answer is. Of course, we can only ever measure zero or one, so we'll have to do an ensemble measurement. We'll perform this measurement many, many times and see how well does the output statistics correspond to the gate that we were trying to create. And we can create, uh, we can evaluate from that an accuracy score. We'll call it this FXEB, as a fidelity of the gate that we were trying to uh, produce. And indeed, we can continue, add a second gate, a third gate, and so on, increase the number of gates, and learn for any order of any gates, how accurate are we able to make them each as individuals. And of course, the more gates we have, eventually the, the fidelity of the gates will start dropping off because we'll be running out of coherence time. The qubit will decohere before we can finish uh, properly completing every gate. But 
we can, doing this kind of uh, protocol, we can extract an error per gate or a fidelity per gate. And the same thing works for two qubit gates as well. We can interleave two qubit gates with layers of single qubit gates, and we can also calibrate the quality of our two qubit gates. The procedure for doing this is actually rather complicated. This graph shows uh, the, the working graph to get from an empty blank slate kind of, kind of situation to having well calibrated two qubit gates. And each node on this graph is one physics experiment, if you will, one set of measurements and, and adjustments that needs to be done in order to set some piece of that calibration. For just a single two qubit gate, we have such a large graph already for, and, and so you can clearly imagine that by the time we get to 50 qubits, we will have thousands of nodes, thousands of physics experiments that have to be done. This cannot be done manually. This, this has to be done by an algorithm. And so a lot of our time is spent actually writing software to calibrate the qubits and calibrate them from any state ideally and reach the desired configuration. To, to highlight though, just how much complexity is here, that same colleague of mine with the musical analogy, his PhD was just these two nodes. So these are, this is actually quite a lot of, of physics wrapped up in this even pretty large graph. And uh, indeed, we, we did write calibration software to calibrate the whole graph. So here's, here's what we got in the end. This shows a heat map of our qubit errors. The plus shapes represent the single qubit error rates by their color. And the little boxes in between them represent the two qubit error by its color. You can see that oh, we're actually we're pretty proud of the, the error rates that we see here. And I want to highlight and, and emphasize that this was not data taken on individual qubits, hero qubits, or on a hero calibration. This was a full system reaching a full system scale performance. So a typical qubit is connected to its four nearest neighbors and operating with those connections. The gates are performed simultaneously on all qubits, and we were able to reach this level of performance. Of course, if we were to just pull out one qubit and focus on it by itself, we would reach a higher value. But what's important is to reach a full functioning system. So with that, we took a picture of our nice system, and, and here you can see the uh, cryostat is there with the processor inside, cables coming out from the top go over to the electronics on the left, and that's where the, the calibration happens on those control electronics. So with that, we have our quantum useful, hopefully quantum prototype, and now we would like to evaluate its usefulness or its functionality rather as a computer. So a computer should be able to demonstrate a small milestone computational task. And since we have built a prototype of around 50 qubits, which is this edge of this regime where no, quantum, no classical computer can enter, we think it would be really nice to be able to push into that regime and beat a classical computer at something. Uh, this is also motivated by the knowledge that while every classical computing equipment can efficiently simulate each other, be it an abacus or a supercomputer, none of them can efficiently simulate a quantum computer. Quantum computation lives in a different complexity class. And we would like to start experiencing that or, or start seeing that manifest by really pushing into a regime where no classical, with a quantum processor where no, no classical processor can keep up. So with that, we set a goal. Our goal is to reach a well-defined computer science milestone when we achieve that, when a quantum computer performs a task that would be too resource intensive for any classical computing machine. Now, this may be a contrived task, and indeed, you'll see in our case, it will be a contrived task, but the point is that, uh, that we reach the limits of, or we test the limits of what a classical computer can do. And of course, that means that the goalposts really are moving here. The classical computation continues to evolve, but since the, the quantum computer lives in a different complexity world than the, the classical computer, we also ex, uh, will observe that they're really on different trajectories. For a small improvement on the classical computer can be overrun by a small improvement on a quantum computer. 
so we need a task for this. We need a task for demonstrating beyond classical performance in our quantum processor. The ideal task, well, we have a few requirements on it. One, it should be easy to solve with quantum hardware. Two, it should be very difficult to solve with classical hardware. Uh, and three, it would be nice if it were easy to check using classical hardware. So some examples of possible, uh, possible such tasks. One is factoring, uh, known as Shor's algorithm. There's a known algorithm for a quantum processor to factor very large, num also very large numbers, but to, to factor, uh, for example, large products of, of prime numbers. Uh, and another one, the Grover algorithm, is for function inversion. Unfortunately, the, the quantum processors that we have today are not yet sophisticated enough to run these algorithms. And certainly in the case of factoring, we're a very long ways off from having a, a processor able to run that kind of algorithm. So we need a different task. When we go back to our requirements list. We really can't compromise on the first two items, but we could give up the third uh, in order to find a task that is better suited for our current system. And so the, the computational task we've identified is the following. We have, we first pick a quantum circuit. So it's some set of gates in some pattern. And then we are curious, what is the output distribution from that particular quantum circuit? The output distribution will be how often should we see which bit strings of zero and one as our measurements? Which bit strings are most likely to be measured? Why would we pick this problem? It seems a little bit arbitrary. Well, it turns out this is a well-studied problem. And in fact, for certain sets, certain choices of gates, uh, if, we, if we choose our gates from, say, a randomly chosen distribution, that guarantees that this problem has high computational complexity. We know that it'll be very difficult for a classical computer to uh, compute which bit strings are most likely to be measured to actually sample that output distribution. And of course, it is a good fit for a quantum computer because this is what a quantum computer can run. So uh, to, to actually try to observe this beyond classical performance, here's the, the path we take. First, we pick a quantum circuit whose output distribution we would like to sample. And then we attack it with both the quantum and a classical computer using the best strategies, respectively. For the quantum case, uh, the best strategy is simply to run the circuit on the quantum processor and measure the output distribution that we, we uh, achieve, or measure the output distribution that comes out at the end. For a classical computer, the best strategy is actually to simulate quantum mechanics using a data center or a supercomputer. To achieve beyond classical performance and to demonstrate beyond classical performance with our random circuit sampling, we'll take the following steps. First, we will pick a quantum circuit whose output distribution we would like to sample. And then we'll go at it with uh, both a quantum processor and a classical processor using the best strategies, respectively. So for the quantum, strat of the quantum processor, that means we simply run the circuit on the quantum hardware that we have and measure the output distribution directly. For the classical processor, on the other hand, we actually simulate quantum mechanics using a data center or a supercomputer. And we can use the classical processing to determine the classical cost of the quantum machine's labor. If that is too high, then we will have achieved our goal. Now, this already in indicates kind of a problem. First off, if we have our quantum processor running in a regime where no classical computer can keep up, then we will not be able to verify that the quantum computer is doing what it's supposed to do. And in order to circumvent that, we will use what we call a verification regime to uh, check to make sure that the quantum computer is behaving correctly in the, in the space that we can and give us confidence that it continues to perform in the same manner when it is beyond what we can check. We use two methods for this. The first is a simple error model in which we compare the predictions of a model with the measured performance. And then the second method is to use both full <clears throat> hard circuits and also use some simplified circuits. These circuits are simplified in such a way that they're easier for the classical computer to compute, but they don't really change the, the workload that the quantum computer feels. They simply reorganize the gates a little bit. So how do we build our model? Well, this is ideally a very simple model and uh, should 
ideally be a, a discrete error model as mentioned before in the requirements on error correction. So we include the single qubit gates, the two qubit gates, and the measurement error, and we basically multiply them together. Uh, having derived the error of each qubit and each two qubit pair by itself, we can use, uh, use this formula and combine the, the errors for each number of qubits and increase, uh, see that, that with increasing number of qubits, the fidelity will drop. And that is a prediction for how the entire processor should behave altogether. Then we need to compare with data. So how do we get the data? Well, we'll take a circuit. Perhaps we'll start with a circuit on just a few of the qubits. We'll measure the output bit strings and feed both the circuit information and the result from the quantum processor into a classical computer. That classical computer can calculate what the, what the output of the circuit should have been and tell us the accuracy of the quantum processor's work. At low numbers of qubits, this is easy to do, both for full circuits and for simplified circuits. And we can see that the data actually overlaps with the model fantastically. The, the full circuits and the simplified circuits agree with the prediction very well, and we recognize that our quantum processor is working as expected. Uh, now, you can already see, though, that the red dots, which are really the full circuits, we start to get a little bit sparse at high values. And indeed, this one last little red dot would take five hours to verify for a machine with one million cores. So this is already getting to be pretty computationally intensive. And now we push just a bit further into the beyond classical regime. We still run our full circuits, um, but at this, at this point, there is no way for us to verify with a classical computer that the quantum computer is doing what it's supposed to do. We do see, however, that the simplified circuits and the model continue to agree fantastically. And we've recorded the data that the quantum computer took for the full circuits so that hopefully someday with uh, more capable classical processing, we'll be able to go back and verify. The classical verification that we've done so far has been uh, collaborative work with the Forschungszentrum in Jülich, uh, NASA, and the Oak Ridge National Laboratory on these various machines. And it uses a couple of different simulation strategies. One that we call the Schrödinger simulation actually stores all of the amplitudes of the quantum state. So it requires very large amounts of memory. For the largest circuits we've simulated, or for the largest circuits we've measured on our quantum computer, it would require dozens of petabytes over a few days for a, a computer, a classical computer, to follow that in simulation. And not having such a machine, we instead come up with an alternative approach where we sacrifice space for time, cut, cutting the circuit into parts, simulating them, and then stitching them back together. And with that, we can make do with, say, only a few terabytes of memory with a sacrifice in the runtime that it would now take thousands of years. So the take home message is we have in our Sycamore processor a machine that can run 53 qubit circuits with non-zero fidelity. And OK, that sounds a bit silly, but the fidelity, this value of non-zero fidelity, is predicted extremely well by a very simple model. And that model gives us a lot of confidence that error correction will be possible in the future. Finally, achieving that same fidelity on a classical machine would require a ridiculous amount of resources. So with that, we say we have achieved our small milestone computational task on our prototype. Um, and just to sort of revisit the big picture, there were sort of two take home messages here from a computer science perspective. We observe really in practice the quantum computer working differently from a classical computer. And from a physics side, we, we find it really fascinating that quantum mechanics actually still works for highly complex systems. You know, our daily lives, we don't see quantum effects manifesting on a regular basis. And a quantum computer is a pretty large system of quantum objects. So we might expect that at some point, the quantum features might break down, but we see that they don't. This is a great, great uh, outlook for quantum computing. So the future of, uh, of our work then kind of pushes in two threads. One, of course, is to continue to develop hardware and, and make uh, software and algorithmic development focused on demonstrating error correction. Uh, but another exciting piece that we get gleaned from this uh, demonstration that we've done is that near-term algorithm development can now take a heuristic approach and we can ev uh, venture into the NISC area where no classical computer can, can take us. So with that, I would like to thank my colleagues and teammates, and I would be like, uh, happy to take your questions.